Welcome to two hours of your life that hopefully will provide you with uh, some public ethics guidance. And uh, my name is Chris Newmeyer. I'm your assistant city attorney. Um, for those of you that I haven't met, uh, your city attorney appointed me last year to work with Morro Bay. And I'm very excited about the opportunity. It's a beautiful community, and I love coming up here and working with everyone. It's almost like a vacation, even though I'm working. So um, thank you for the opportunity. And what I'm talking about today is AB 1234 training. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that, it's actually Assembly Bill 1234 that was passed about 20 odd years ago. And it was in response to a lot of uh, ethical violations by some water boards up in Sacramento. And uh, I'll get into that example later in my slideshow. And so now what the law says is that within one year of being elected or appointed to an office, and then every two years after that, you have to do two hours of training. And that's what we're doing here today. And I also want to emphasize that I'm not here to teach you personal ethics. Um, you know, I assume all of you already have a moral compass and all of you already have an ethical code you live by. What I'm talking about is public law ethics. And it's not usually the situation where someone who's gone to these trainings is going to say, oh, I knew that was wrong and now I know for sure it's wrong. It's often the case that folks don't know the actual rules that apply and they don't know there's disclosure requirements. They don't know there's disqualification requirements. They don't know that there might be a conflict. And so what I'm here to do today is to help you get that gut feeling or to know when a red flag should be raised that maybe something you're doing is going to require talking to the city attorney, city manager, city clerk, um, and maybe disqualify yourself, uh, perhaps uh, provide some form to the city. And you don't need to walk away from here or expect to walk away with some encyclopedic knowledge of the laws. Uh, the whole point is to just give you that issue spotting ability. So you know when you're confronted with an issue and you got that feeling, maybe there should be something else I should be doing on this matter, then that's the point of today, to get to that point. And feel free to raise your hand or ask questions throughout the presentation. Um, I know it's... Uh-oh. Well, I have a loud voice, but... Okay, all right, I'm back. Is this too loud, by the way? Okay. Um, feel free to ask questions, raise your hand throughout the presentation. Um, as fun as I can try to make it to be, it still admittedly is somewhat of a dry topic. Uh, so I have some pictures I put in the slideshow, and hopefully we'll have some stories that you all might be able to share. So to get started into our two-hour journey, and there'll be a break an hour in, the objectives. Uh, as I mentioned, it's to familiarize you all with the laws that govern your service and when to ask questions, not to be a legal expert by the end of these two hours. And one of the things that the Attorney General says we should emphasize in these courses, the California Attorney General, is that this is just a baseline of the laws that I'm going to be presenting to you. Uh, of course, the state of California encourages everybody to uh, go beyond that and to uh, apply higher ethical standards than the baseline I'm discussing today. And of course, today is to make sure you're in compliance with the law and you meet your Assembly Bill 1234 requirements. So it's a two-hour session. Uh, there's specified content that I'm supposed to cover. Um, the focus is more on breadth, going over a bunch of different issues than to drill down into one or two. And uh, like I said, I encourage questions. Um, raise your hand, yell out uh, any form you want. I'll repeat it back into the microphone so it's recorded. And also to make sure that you get your credit, uh, be sure you signed in and then you also get a certificate. And that certificate you'll then need to turn back into the city clerk. And keep in mind it'll be a public record, of course. And obviously, if you turn it in and somebody does a Public Records Act request, and I'll get into those laws, and they see that you turned it in, great. Um, sometimes uh, local watchdogs will contact a city to see who hasn't turned them in. So that's the whole point of uh, really having them as public records. So ethics laws versus ethics. Uh, I'd briefly mention this. Um, law is just the starting point for ethical analysis. 
The law is what we must do. Uh, ethics are what we should do. And just because it's legal doesn't necessarily mean it's ethical. And so that's one of the points that I'd emphasized before, and I want to emphasize again, was that after you are aware of these different laws and restrictions, it doesn't mean that you can't hold yourself to a higher ethical standard. Now, there's four main areas that uh, the Attorney General suggests that we go over. Uh, trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, fairness. And then those will be broken down into four main areas that I'm going to cover, which are personal financial gain, transparency, uh, perks of office, and then a fair process. So to get some audience participation, um, does anyone think of any good examples in the news recently of where there's been some alleged ethical violation of a national politician? Anybody? What? Well, we can throw one out. Does anyone want to raise their hand? Before or after? I don't want to be partisan. Yeah, back over there. The what? Oh, well, the example just given was uh, in South Dakota. Um, there were some new rules that uh, were recently passed, and now folks are trying to overturn them. Well, that's a good example of, uh, I think, the framework out there of people trying to bring about ethical rules and other people fighting them in some respects. Um, any other examples? Well, yeah? Yeah, um, actually, that's something that's dominated the news. In fact, um, for those of you that have been uh, looking at the details of some of these conflicts, uh, the federal constitution has something I'd never heard of called the emoluments clause. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right. And apparently, uh, the founders, uh, 200 plus years ago, said that you couldn't take gifts from like foreign princes and uh, dignitaries. It's never really been an issue until now. And it's an open question how that's going to be interpreted. Um, so, yeah, that's been dominating the news. Yes? Uh, the Coastal Commission um, has also dominated, I think, in California on conflicts of interest. Um, and so they commission their own Coastal Commission and they're shooting me from Florida and so forth. And the Gulf Coast is seeing um, the outcome of that. So, the example just mentioned was the Coastal Commission and who they meet with and uh, who actually uh, they're having contact with before they do their public meetings. Um, and that's a great example of uh, one of the goals of transparency, which I'll talk about today, which is that when public officials have a meeting, um, it seems inefficient, if you will, that they have to talk about everything in public with the public there until you remember that the whole reason is to make sure you don't do backroom deals. Um, Hello? Okay. Um, the, the whole reason is to make sure that there aren't backroom deals and that the public can see what the politicians and the elected officials are, uh, the thinking process, the deciding process. So if you have someone in the Coastal Commission that is making up their mind beforehand and then they're not publicly letting everyone know who they heard from, what they heard, then the public's not part of the decision process. And that's one of the main goals of California ethics laws, to make sure the public knows what the elected officials are doing. Okay, so there are some good examples. Uh, it's both local, state, national. And now I have a little test here. Um, so in your head, unless you want to volunteer, uh, rate yourself. Um, am I always ethical, mostly, somewhat, seldom, or never? So think about that in your head. Now, that once you have your uh, label for yourself, I'll tell you most people are going to pick always or mostly. And if they pick mostly, it's because there might be one or two situations where they just think you've got to fight fire with fire or you know, the end justifies the means. But generally, most people go with always or mostly. Now I want you to think, how would others rate you? And the point I'm making here is that intentions aren't always the same as actions. And so 
most people would like to think that they're ethical. Uh, it's rare to find someone who's going to say, I'm proudly unethical. <laughs> However, uh, the actions you do are how others judge you on it. And we're all in the public eye here. Uh, we're all public servants. And so what you got to remember is that it's not just intentions. It's what the public both sees and it's what the public perceives. And that's part of what these rules that we're talking about today are meant to engender in all of you is that it's the actions taken, not intentions. And here are some reasons that people will rationalize unethical conduct. It was necessary. Uh, it was legal. Uh, that doesn't mean it's ethical. It won't hurt anyone. Uh, who's going to know? Everyone's doing it. I didn't gain personally. I deserve it or I'm fighting fire with fire. So there are reasons out there that people use to act unethically, but hopefully uh, none of us will fall to that temptation in our public duties. So as I was alluding to earlier, the purpose of ethics laws is to protect the public's trust in the institutions and the individuals that serve them. And so it's not just a matter of good intentions. It's a matter of making sure the public trusts their government and the public knows that their government's working for them. And so in public service ethics, uh, perception's as important as reality. Um, if uh, your intentions are great, uh, but the public thinks that there's something unethical going on, it's still going to start grinding government to uh, uh, slower than it should be working. So it's good to make sure you consider what the public thinks and sees. And gut is not always a reliable guide. Um, and that's why we're here today, to go over the rules that Sacramento has passed. And... Um, I have a little saying down here. Uh, it's kind of corny, but if in doubt, send it out. So uh, if you're in doubt about some ethical issue, sending it out means ask the city attorney, ask the city manager, talk to the city clerk, um, talk to somebody at city hall so you can get the advice on what you should probably do in the situation that is troubling you. And I have a little cartoon here. Um, doesn't matter that you never got caught. I mean, obviously, uh, if someone is uh, uh, approaching their uh, reward in uh, their afterlife and, uh, you know, the idea being, of course, <laughs> doesn't matter that no one found out. Um, so, a little joke there. So, I went over these four concepts, trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, fairness, and I'm going to get into now these different areas of those four concepts. Um, and we'll be talking about bribery, conflicts of interest, contractual conflicts, campaign contributions, the Political Reform Act, Brown Act, Public Records Act, gift restrictions, misuse of public funds, gifts of public funds, mass mailing restrictions, and then fairness, protection against bias, due process, incompatible offices, competitive bidding, anti-nepotism. So understanding ethics laws, um, as I have already said and I'll emphasize throughout this course, what you need to come away with from here today I would suggest is when you need to ask questions. Uh, you don't need to be the expert that when you have a gray situation, you know what the answer is. It's better to ask questions and to make sure that you talk to city attorney or someone else at city hall or you call the FPPC. I'm going to have some numbers here later um, where you can actually make anonymous phone calls to the Fair Political Practices Commission. If you have any questions about uh, possible ethical violations, you can anonymously contact the state of California's uh, ethics group, the FPPC, ask them questions. Um, you can also identify who you are and they can give you a written response. Um, you can also ask for a formal opinion too, which becomes public record. And one of the nice things about the FPPC and why it's better than a city attorney's advice is that, as I'll talk about later, uh, just because a city attorney or your legal counsel says that something is not going to violate ethics laws, and if later a judge finds out it does, uh, that's not immunity. Um, and there's some cases I'll talk about where a city attorney mistakenly told a council member that there wasn't a conflict, the court thought otherwise. However, if the FPPC issues a formal written opinion to you saying go ahead and do something and the facts you told them are what they have in the report, that provides you immunity from civil prosecution. So that's something to remember. Yes? What, what is the, 
the Fair Political Practices Commission. Yeah, and I'll have some numbers later that um, that uh, you can use to contact them in emails. So another little joke here, uh, Calvin and Hobbes, uh, one of my favorites. Um, so Calvin's telling his mom, I read this ethics book you got me, and she says, well, what do you think of it? And he said, it really made me see things differently. It's given me a lot to think about. And she said, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And he says, it's complicated my life. Don't, don't give me any more. <laughs> so um, that's uh, often the attitude some folks will have about all these rules, but it's the reality of uh, uh, being a public servant. We have these uh, rules from Sacramento. So here's a quote from Abraham Lincoln. Um, and I do think this is uh, an interesting observation. Uh, Nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. So there's four groups of ethics laws, and now I'm going to be getting into the four of them we're talking about. Uh, Personal financial gain, personal advantages and perks, governmental transparency, and fair process. So the first one, group one, personal financial gain issues. Uh, The principle that public servants should not benefit financially from their positions. That seems like a pretty obvious rule, but the question is, is how does that work in reality? So uh, I don't think anyone in here is going to have any questions about whether bribery is unethical or against the law. Um, But then we start getting into financial interest disqualification uh, requirements, which um, becomes a little bit trickier. And then we get into revolving door restrictions, which are relatively new laws that California have on not going immediately to the private sector and lobbying your old government employee employer after you've left uh, public office. So what is bribery? Does anyone uh, have a common sense definition they want to throw out? Yep, exactly. Uh, Bribery is one of the easy ones here, um, you know, because it's easy to understand. If somebody has a contract that they want the city to sign off on, and that contractor has decided to take you to Hawaii with him for uh, four days and your family and pay for all expenses, uh, there's a good chance that there's some bribery going on there. Uh, Penalties for it, uh, loss of office, prison time, if it's intentional. Fines, restitution, attorney's fees, and public embarrassment. And, of course, the briber also uh, can uh, face uh, years in state prison. And it's not an issue of whether you take the bribe or not. You can't, like, get to the edge of it and, like, think about it and, like, weigh the pros and cons. Uh, it's just the fact that somebody's offered a bribe and you reasonably uh, are going to accept it. It's not the actual taking of the bribe. So steer clear of uh, uh, bribery. So here's an example, um, shrimp gate. Has anybody heard of this? Uh, what are your recollections of it? Yeah, it, it was, yeah, the comment was just that it's from San Francisco. It, it was a big deal uh, in the early 90s. Um, Board of Equalization member Paul Carpenter eventually sentenced to seven years in prison. Um, what had happened was the FBI, and they occasionally do this, had uh, created uh, a fake business and they decided to go and try to get uh, a law passed in Sacramento uh, to help out this uh, shipping, in, this uh, boating industry. Shrimp, that's why I called it Shrimpgate. And actually, some bills were passed in Sacramento, and the governor knew about this, so he vetoed them. But finally, when uh, it all came out that money had changed hands to pass these laws in Sacramento, Um, Carpenter ended up pleading guilty to racketeering, extortion, and conspiracy for accepting $20,000 from undercover FBI agents uh, for this fictitious shrimp fishery that uh, the laws were going to help. And um, actually, it's almost like divine justice was following this guy around because he got off on a technicality when a federal appeals court ruled the jury had not been properly instructed. Uh, he was forced to leave public office. Does anyone know what happened to him after he got off on a technicality? Um, 
This guy ended up uh, three years later uh, facing more charges for another issue, fled to Costa Rica claiming that he was seeking a special cancer treatment down there and died. So <laughs> that's what happened to Carpenter. Um, it's uh, a sad story of uh, where this took him and, of course, you know, all the attention that was focused. And, um, you know, the FBI is out there sometimes trying to do these things. Another example, uh, Moreno Valley, more recent, 2014. Uh, has anyone heard of this one? Um, this is actually uh, reputedly the biggest bribe ever recorded on camera. Um, this guy had stacks of cash brought to his office. Uh, he had over $2 million in cash put on his desk. And uh, you got to wonder, uh, how did he even get this far in life to where people... <laughs> People are bringing in stacks of cash, and uh, it was just a slam dunk conviction. I mean, you know, the agents brought in, uh, like, almost a, out of a movie, like in duffel bags, and put cash on his desk, and, you know, he took the bribe. And um, the issue was whether or not they were going to rezone some property to change its value from a few hundred thousand to millions of dollars. And uh, he was involved with the property sale, and um, he ended up getting sentenced to prison. So bribery also uh, is related to extortion, um, receiving rewards for appointing someone to office, uh, and embezzlement, converting public funds or property to your own use. So now I'm going to get into more of the, um, uh, I guess, nuanced or detailed aspects of uh, Sacramento's laws. Um, disqualification based on financial interests. Now, this is one that those of you who sit on commissions, boards, on council, um, any sort of uh, Brown Act covered body where you're making decisions in the public at a public meeting. And uh, sometimes folks need to be disqualified because of a financial interest in the decision before them. Now, what I want to emphasize is that disqualification doesn't mean that the official has done anything wrong. It just means that they actually have uh, interest in the community, that um, they have uh, uh, business in the community, they have some sort of property in the community. And disqualification just means that the law is going to not put that person into a position where they have to try to act perhaps wow. more impartial. <laughs> wow, that was neat. Yeah, is everyone awake now? <laughs> Um, the disqualification standards are just meant to make sure that people aren't in a position where they have to try to act perhaps more impartial than human nature allows. Um, and so to disqualify from a decision, uh, there's a process you go through, but basically you don't talk to the other folks making the decision, you're not present at the meeting when the decision's being made, and uh, hopefully there's still a quorum left with the folks that are still in the room. And a disqualifying financial interest, again, you don't need to know all the legal details here per se. Again, the city attorney's office, city manager can always talk to you about these. But the basic four-point test, and two of them are here, is that a public official has a disqualifying financial interest if the decision will have a reasonably foreseeable material financial effect. So the first two steps are, is it foreseeable? that they're going to have uh, an effect on your financial interests, and is it material? So is it actually going to affect them in some significant way? Now I'm gonna get to some of the different standards like the 500 foot rule, the $2,000 investment in business rule, but those are the first two steps. Um, is it going to have, uh, is it going to be reasonably foreseeable that it'll affect your financial interests, whether it's business, real property, income, um, and is it material? Is it actually going to have a real impact? So as I mentioned before, there's a difference between disqualification versus absentation, abstention. Um, the mere existence of a conflict doesn't imply wrongdoing. And I want to emphasize that uh, by the nature of caring enough about your community that you're involved in public service, you probably have some roots in that community. And with that roots often can come business interests, property, uh, income, and so inevitably there'll be decisions that conflict with those. And that's all that disqualification is. Um, and that's legally required. Uh, abstention is voluntary. Uh, sometimes a public official will think that even if the law doesn't require me not to participate, I still should not participate in the decision. So as I mentioned, what kind of interests? 
Um, the first two questions, the FPPC has a four-part test now. Uh, does anyone remember, uh, maybe from some other trainings, uh, how many steps the, the test used to be? Anyone from uh, past trainings or... Well, the good news is, is it's gone from eight steps to four steps, so at least it's a little bit simpler, um, but usually the attorneys deal with this. So the first two steps, is it reasonably foreseeable, and will there be a material effect? So what does that mean? Um, well, one of the rules is the $500 rule. Uh, if there's a source of direct income of $500 or more in the prior 12 months in the decision that you're making then uh, that is going to be reasonably foreseeable and it's material. And that includes your income, promised income, uh, your spouse or your child's income, and also loans or guarantees. Any questions, by the way, as uh, we're going through this? Yeah? Yeah, you're actually, the question was uh, if you're on a public works board and you have 30 or 40 streets that are being paved and one of them's near your house, uh, are you disqualified from approving that uh, repavement? Um, you're actually right on the mark with the third step in this four-step test, which is uh, if it affects the public generally, uh, then you're not disqualified. Um, now, uh, I don't want to say that any specific situation that you have in mind without knowing more of the facts, you are or are not disqualified. So don't take this as being advice on that specific situation. But in general, if 25% or more of the public are generally impacted in the same way, then uh, it doesn't matter if these first two steps are met. And I'll get to the public generally exception. Um, yeah? Um, that's actually a good question. Um, advisory boards that don't make the final decision, um, what is the difference, if any? Uh, the California Attorney General has looked into that exact issue, and um, they have concluded that if your vice is regularly taken, then you're subject to disqualification. So as I've always said in these trainings, if you think the city council doesn't listen to you, then maybe it doesn't apply. <laughs> but, but if you think they're going to take your advice, then it probably does apply to you. Yeah. Uh, the question is, is that if you're disqualified, for example, on the Planning Commission, or if you have decided to disqualify yourself because of a personal connection to an applicant, uh, can you still come up and speak as a member of the public? Um, you can come up and speak as a member of the public uh, at any point if you have voluntarily recused yourself. If you have been legally disqualified, and as I would mentioned before, there's a difference between it's your friend but you don't have any financial interests from them that are involved, but you think you should step down, um, in that case, you can speak as a member of the public. If the law has disqualified you, then you can only talk if the decision impacts your property or your business. Does that answer the question? Okay. Yes? Uh, the question is, is the state law overrule the federal law? Uh, um, yeah. I'm not sure which uh, state federal conflict you're referring to. Yeah, 
Yeah, actually, um, without trying to get too deep into the legal analysis, um, uh, a city council meeting is what uh, the First Amendment considers to be a, a limited public forum, which means that the discussion there is limited to the city's business. Now, generally, the public, when they come up and talk on any or all issues that involve the city, are exercising, of course, their First Amendment rights. But because it's a limited public forum, and you have, say, three-minute time limit on public comment, you can only talk about things on the agenda, um, there's other restrictions. Uh, another one is the ones we're talking about. Now, um, you certainly could, uh, you know, go to a public place and, you know, talk all you want. Um, but you shouldn't be talking to other members that are decision makers and trying to influence their, their decision if you've been personally disqualified. Um, but that's a really good question. Uh, you know, the First Amendment rights that we all have um, definitely, uh, you know, underpins a lot of what we can do and not do at city council meetings and what the public can do. Uh, any other questions right now? Okay, so... Um, Again, I'm just going through some rule of thumbs here on disqualifications, uh, $500 rule. Um, there's the $2,000 rule. Um, that's if you have $2,000 invested in a business entity or interest in real property. And that, again, can uh, trigger that it's going to be a material effect. And then another rule, um, this is probably the rule that is most commonly known as the 500-foot rule. Years ago, it used to be the 300-foot rule. Now it's 500-foot. Um, basically, if there's a decision before you that affects uh, your real property and, the, for example, um, a CUP, a conditional use permit, is uh, before the Planning Commission on uh, allowing a business to operate and you have real property that's uh, 200 feet away, um, then that probably means that you're disqualified from uh, deciding on it. The reason why is that, um, you know, we'd all be inclined to try to make a decision based on what will affect our real property value. So it's just assumed that if your property is within 500 feet, that you need to disqualify yourself. And again, I want to emphasize, uh, it's not that the property holder has done anything wrong. It's just that these laws just come in to make sure that they're never in a situation where they have to weigh personal interest versus public interest. Um, however, there's been uh, a recent change. It used to just be that if you were more than 500 feet, you were in the clear. Uh, now, the FPPC, the Fair Political Practice Commission, has said, or if reasonably, it might affect your property. Um, anyone want to guess what that means? Because <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, and so that's always something for concern. Um, so the rule of thumb, 500 feet, but if it's 600 feet and it's obvious that it could affect the property value, then you probably want to just voluntarily disqualify yourself. Um, another interest, gifts. Now, uh, for those of you, I assume all of you, is anyone in here not a Form 700 filer? Uh, does, uh, I'm assuming everyone in here files Form 700s. Um, it's the annual um, uh, disclosure of financial interest in the city. Um, on that Form 700, uh, if you receive a gift from somebody, that's not families or friends or like Christmas or birthdays or Hanukkah. Um, if you receive a gift of $50 or more, you report it. And then from that source, whoever gave you the gift, like say a local business person, you can't receive more than $470 total for a year. Now, an interesting corollary of that is that uh, you're not supposed to take more than 470 but also if you did receive a gift of more than 470 and you made a decision involving that person, that breaks another rule, which is that you've exceeded the gift contribution limit. The only way it kind of doesn't overlap directly is your Form 700, you report everything for a calendar year, the 470 gift rule goes back 12 months from the decision you made. But bottom line, you report the $50 or more, cap it at 470, and if there's gifts of more than 470 from somebody and you're making a decision involving them, then you should be disqualifying yourself. And that could, uh, for example, involve, say, um, a family member because 
Um, the law doesn't say that you can't exchange Christmas gifts or birthday gifts or whatnot, um, but if you do get an enormous gift from somebody uh, and uh, it's considered to be okay because it's holiday or birthday, um, then this disqualification could apply. Sounds like uh, the law is trying to ruin the holidays, huh? <laughs> well, like I said, uh, this applies. This is meant to apply to business people generally, or you know, property owners that they wouldn't be giving you a gift anyways. And this kind of corresponds to a gut feeling. I mean, if you're getting a gift out of nowhere from someone you've never met, and then you find out a week later that they're before your board or commission with the decision to be made, that's what this is about. Um, so the third, yes. Um, lunches, if they're over $50, then they need to be reported. And the question is, is, uh, what about lunches? So if you get uh, a lunch from someone and they pay for the lunch and it's over $50, then you report it. And if you have successive lunches, like say, say you have uh, five lunches that are each $15 from the same person, then you would end up reporting that because you went over the 50. Okay. Yes. The question is about uh, uh, regular or continual lunches with developers. Um, so you're uh, saying that even if they're not uh, buying the lunch, is there another? Oh, um, the issue then is just that you can't end up going over $470 uh, in a calendar year from the same source. So if developer X uh, take someone to lunch, there's no problem with, with them buying you lunch. Um, it's just that you can't go over the $470, $470 a year total from that one developer. And also, um, you have these Form 700s that you filed. And so uh, you do sometimes have in cities records requests made and Form 700s are pulled. And then people say, well, look, you know, you got a lunch. So, you know. What do you got to say about that? Um, it, it doesn't happen that often, but that's the issue. Does that answer the question? Okay. Um, so the gentleman uh, uh, somewhat towards the back had asked the question about um, what happens if uh, basically it's affecting the whole community? Uh, you know, do you disqualify yourself then? Um, the answer is no. Um, even if there's a reasonable foreseeable impact and it's material, like, let's say uh, your property is within, uh, you know, 200 feet of some decision, but the decision that's being made, to use a really good example, is redoing the entire general plan of the city. Well, it'd be impossible for any of the council members or any of the planning commissioners, assuming they live in, they all, you know, uh, have property in the city, uh, to decide on a general plan because it affects the whole community, right? So that's what this rule is meant to encompass, is public generally exception. Um, so roughly speaking, if 25% or more of the public is impacted by a decision and there isn't something unique about the impact on your property, then uh, there isn't a conflict and you don't need to disqualify yourself. Now, um, I would strongly urge uh, any of you, if you have concluded that uh, there's going to be a reasonably foreseeable material financial impact, but then you think maybe the public generally exception applies, I strongly encourage you to consult with legal counsel, city attorney, or call the FPPC. Don't wing this one on your own. Um, this is one that um, it's good to make sure you get it right. Um, but it does impact a lot of city decisions. And if you think about it, if this exception didn't apply, then some decisions could never be made. <laughs> I mean, because they impact the whole city. And then for how long? So it's basically 12 months before the decision, um, if any of these things are triggered in the 12 months before the decision is made. And here are some ethics resources. Um, the lady over here had asked about the FPPC. Um, here's an email. You can email the FPPC. Um, you can call this phone number, 
And like I said, you can call and you don't have to identify who you are. They can just give you informal advice. Um, and then there's a group called the Institute for Local Government, which uh, um, my law firm, Alshar and Winder, is a supporter of. We work with them, as do a lot of other law firms that do public uh, entity law. Um, they're a nonprofit group that has lots of handouts. In fact, the handout you all got today is an ILG handout, which is kind of a summary of what I'm talking about today. And, of course, the city attorney. You can talk to them as well. So what do you, you do if you're disqualified? Um, it's reasonably foreseeable that there'll be a material financial impact. For example, uh, a business where you have an investment of $10,000 is coming up before the council, uh, the council or planning commissioner board for a decision, maybe a contract to be executed with them. Um, with, well, that's a whole different issue. Forget the contract. <laughs> we'll get into 1090 later. Um, but if there's a decision coming up on land use or zoning, and um, you're disqualified. Well, this, uh, I think that's Thomas Jefferson. Does anyone else think that's somebody? I don't know. I just think it's Thomas Jefferson. Any other guesses? Mozart? <laughs> Could be Mozart, yeah. Um, so uh, if you're disqualified, what do you need to do? Um, don't discuss or influence staff or colleagues. Uh, identify the nature of the conflict at the meeting, and then you leave the room unless it's on consent calendar, and uh, no voting or discussing the matter. And something to note is that you don't count towards a quorum. And the reason why I mention this is that if, uh, say, you have a five-member uh, council, commissioner board, most of them are, and three people are disqualified, but a decision has to be made, then there's a whole separate process for basically drawing straws on which one of those three then go um, so remember that if you have three disqualified. So leave the room rule. Um, it used to be that you didn't have to leave the room. Uh, some of you might remember uh, the old rule. That's changed. Um, you're supposed to actually physically leave the room when the discussion is had and the vote's taken. And then there are limited exceptions, though, um, to leave the room. Even if you're disqualified from... Uh, discussing or voting on a decision, if it involves your property and you want to say something to the, the decision makers, then you can then basically come back around, come up and do public comment. And so um, that obviously makes sense because just because you're working in public service doesn't mean you're disqualified from acting as just a member of the public when your personal interests are impacted. And penalties. Um, I like this quote from uh, George Washington, uh, few men have the virtue to withstand the highest bidder. And, um, and of course, if uh, you don't withstand the highest bidder and it's unethical, then uh, penalties. The decision can be invalidated, loss of office, you can be disqualified for often four to five years from ever running for office or being appointed again. Uh, misdemeanor, uh, there can be jail at time and penalties. Uh, thousands of dollars in fines, attorney's fees, and embarrassment, personal and political. Now, uh, I briefly mentioned contracts a few minutes ago, and uh, I want to emphasize that there's a whole different body of law governing contracts. So if you're talking about a decision for land use, or you're talking about a decision for, say, a public works project, um, that is Political Reform Act, everything we've just talked about. There's a whole separate rule, it's government code 1090, and it involves contracts. And the biggest difference here is that if the city is entering into a contract where you have a personal financial interest, the city can't enter into the contract, uh, period. Uh, it just can't be done. Um, disqualification may not be enough. And so it's important to remember that if government code 1090 is triggered, then the contract is just something that even if you leave the room, even if you have no involvement in the decision, the city just can't be entering into that contract. Now, uh, there's an example of this guy sweating for good reason, um, Thompson versus Cal. So uh, Supreme Court in 1985 actually heard this case. It went from trial court to appeals court to the California Supreme Court. And this is a perfect example of everything going wrong for this poor guy and him violating government code 1090. Um, 
there was a city council member who had some land that uh, it was known that the city was interested in using for a public park. And so the city council member sold the land to a developer who then immediately sold it to the city. Now, the city attorney had actually told the council member, yeah, you're fine, you know, just use that middleman and you're okay. And so they went ahead and uh, did the sale. And then a citizen sued, which can be done, uh, saying that it violated government code 1090. And when the court case was all over, the city kept the land and the council member had to also give the money back. And so whatever the developer had paid him went to the city. And so 1090, government code 1090 uh, consequences are ones that focus very, very, very strongly in making sure the person that might violate it has no interest in getting even close to that violation. Because the contract becomes void if it's one of these 1090 contracts, but the city keeps all its benefits. <laughs> so... Uh, the person who loses out is the council member, planning commissioner, uh, whoever uh, entered into the contract. They have to give the money back, the benefit of the bargain, and the city keeps the benefit. So, yes? Is Yeah, the question is, is that uh, uh, is there a time limit between um, the council member selling property and then that property from the middleman or middlewoman selling it to the city? Um, there absolutely is a, a time uh, element here. Um, it doesn't mean that if you sold property to somebody and then 10 years later they sell it to the city um, or maybe even a year later they sell it to the city that there's an issue. What had happened here was that uh, it became clear through the court case that the developer and the council member both talked about the developers buying it to sell it to the city to get around the 1090 violation. And so the city attorney mistakenly had said, well, technically you're following the law, so you're okay. And the court said, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, we know what's going on here. You know, you just turned right around and sold it to the city, and you already were talking about getting the permits for this land and for the use of it. So, um, yes, there, there definitely is a time element, and a lot of it comes down to good faith, um, you know, what the good faith element is. Um, yes, in the back? Um, actually, the question is, is whether a city attorney is counsel for planning commission. The city attorney definitely is, but the uh, thing I want to emphasize is if the city attorney gets it wrong, you don't have immunity in the court. So um, in this case, uh, the city attorney gave the wrong advice, and when the council member went to court, it wasn't a defense that the city attorney said it was okay. Um, and so uh, if any of you have had questions that are a little tricky that have gone to the city attorney, um, the city attorney will then say, let's write a letter to the FPPC. Because if you get that letter from the state agency, that letter provides you immunity. Uh, yes? Um, the question is, is, does the council member have recourse against the city attorney? Um, you know, I guess if the city attorney acted uh, maliciously or it was, uh, you know, uh, bad research or uh, there could be. Not in this. It didn't happen in this case. Yeah. Well, the city attorney would probably be fired. That's the first thing that would probably happen. Um, and then whether or not a court would find... Uh, um, liability. It's an interesting question, you know, uh, whether or not it would basically be malpractice. I mean, I suppose there would be, there could be a malpractice suit, and that would be uh, the way that it would be pursued. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Well, th- this this specific issue here uh, with the 1090 contract violation and then also disqualification from decisions, um, both of those are ones where if the city attorney gives advice on it and there is any question on whether or not the advice is correct, the city attorney should say, now let's go to the FPPC as well. Um, and so what I've been emphasizing the FPPC part about here is that um, the FPPC is always available, um, and city attorney will often say, let's go to the FPPC and get their advice too. Um, but keep in mind that uh, 1090 involves contracts being signed between the city and, of course, you know, some financial interest of uh, the public official. Uh, if it doesn't involve a contract, then the consequences aren't like this, where basically you give everything back and the city keeps it all. Um, so, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why it's important to have good legal counsel, uh, really. I mean, and why, you know, attorneys, um, you know, uh, sometimes come, sometimes go, you know, and you want to make sure you have one that you can rely on and trust. Yes? Yes? Well, see, this is the, the question is is whether the council member made the city aware of the sale uh, prior to the developer selling it. This is uh, again, there's a difference between disqualification and then contracts. So even if the uh, city knew about it, then it's you still can't dis, you, disqualification won't make it a legal contract. Uh, because uh, that's why I'm emphasizing that under Government Code 1090 contracts where literally your business or you are signing a contract with the city, <clears throat> excuse me, that's a whole different issue than uh, having a land use issue where it might affect your property. There you can just walk away and let other people make the decision. But this is the contract. And so even if the city knows, you can't disqualify yourself. It just can't be done. Okay. Uh, yes? No, this actually this example is one I always give in these trainings, and it's always the one everyone <laughs> wants to know more most about. Yes, the question is: is should should the city attorney have told the city council not to purchase the land? Yes, yeah, the the city attorney definitely should have told the council, um, you know this land is being bought through a straw man. And, uh, you know, what's going to happen is that uh, that council member is really going to um, uh, be disadvantaged by uh, having to give the money back and give up the land. I agree. Yes? The question is, is do attorneys have to carry errors and omissions? Of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the question is, is whether um, this council member would have recourse against the attorney through errors or omissions, which is professional liability insurance. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, as I'd mentioned, uh, if a malpractice case was brought, um, I mean, the way this would go if the council member wanted to pursue the legal recourse against the attorney is that they would bring a malpractice suit in the courts, they would report them to the state bar. Um, those would be the first two things that you'd do. And, you know, the attorney could lose their license. Um, the insurance could be triggered. They might be personally liable. Yes? Um, the question is, Is uh, was the developer uh, buying the land to then subdivide it? Well, 
Um, yeah, in, the, in this in this case here, uh, the land was going to be purchased by the city to become a park, and so that was where this had been. That that's the facts here, but um, yeah, I mean the developers could have uh, pursued subdivision of the land. I guess does that answer your question or? Okay. Sure. Yeah. The city really needed that piece of land when it comes to personal ownership. Is there a way for the city to buy it? Um, Rob's asking if the city really needed that land, and uh, is there a way to buy it? Well, one way would be to um, everyone agree to just go do eminent domain through the courts. I mean that that would that's what immediately comes to mind, and you know eminent domain is theoretically supposed to provide fair market value to the uh, landowner. Um, you know sometimes fair market value is less than what the landowner values it at, which is why people criticize eminent domain. But um, but yeah, that would be one way to do it. Yes. Uh, the question is, is whether uh, the advisory board, if they make a decision that citizens don't like, are indemnified by the city attorney? Um, well, uh, if the citizens don't like the decision, um, there would need to be more. The citizens would have to point out that there was some law broken. Um, otherwise, uh, there would be no issue of indemnification uh, that, that comes up in the first place. Yeah, um, I, you know, in general, as we know, uh, it's rare that you're going to get consensus among all the members of the public for any controversial issue. So you're always going to have one side or the other, if not many sides, uh, upset with the outcome. So. Yes, the uh, observation was that if uh, citizens were upset about an advisory board decision, then really they would be suing the city uh, after they've exhausted their administrative remedies to, if you will, overturn the contract. And absolutely, um, that would be how it would play out. Uh, yes? Uh, the question is, is whether the developer's motivations were examined. Um, I'm not sure uh, if the developer knew that there were problems uh, here or whether the developer was hoodwinked by it all. I'm not sure. It was a, the question is, is whether the developer uh, paid the uh, offered the property for the same price as uh, was paid to the council member. It was about the same price. The developer got to keep the money in this case. It's the council member that had to pay the money he received from the developer back to the city. Uh, yes? Yeah, the observation was that um, if the property had not been for sale in the first place, then uh, that would be a good example. That would be a good indicator of collusion, and I agree.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, the observation on uh, uh, there's been personal experience with developers proposing uh, questionable um, transactions, which definitely is why we're doing this training to be able to see that. Uh, yes. Uh, the question is, is if the contract was canceled, why does the city get to keep the land? Because that's how the government code's written, is that the city shouldn't be uh, punished for uh, its uh, officials making a bad decision. In fact, the city gets a windfall. <laughs> the city gets it for free, really. I mean, I, you know, I've always wondered in this case, did the other council members know what was going on? And they just thought, hey, you know, we're going to get this land and we're getting the money back? I don't know, but uh, you never know. Okay, so, um, yeah, that, that example always uh, gets people's attention, which is why I use it um, to illustrate uh, if it's a contract and you have a financial interest, a personal financial interest in the contract, and it's being proposed for the city to sign up on it, be very careful um, because these are the consequences. Um, future employment issues. Uh, this is one of the last areas of this first topic, which is usually one of the longest on uh, personal financial gain. Um, there's a revolving door prohibition. So um, you can't represent uh, people for pay for a year after leaving an agency, and that's the government code. You can certainly advocate uh, um, if it, you're not being paid to do it, but uh, you can't be basically a paid lobbyist and come back. You have to wait a year. And you shouldn't be participating in decisions involving future employers, which only the future would tell, um, you know, what happens. But uh, if it turns out that, you know, immediately after uh, leaving your position, suddenly you got this great job with someone you'd made a decision for, then there might be uh, legal issues and there might be investigation. So best practices. Uh, avoid temptation to look at public service as an opportunity for financial gain. I don't think that anyone in here... Um, is going to be looking at it that way at any rate, but remember that. Um, yes, question in the back? Um, top manager would be somebody that's going to be having uh, an executive decision-making ability. Um, involving uh, um, the issue that impacts the business that comes uh, before the city. And so if you're basically making uh, life a lot easier for them and then later they give you a job, then that indicates there's some sort of uh, pay-to-play going on. Uh, yes? Um, it could. It could. Um, you know, this is something where it's more of uh, there's no bright line test. It's more of a case by case. But um, if it's clear that uh, you're giving benefits to somebody and then later they give you a job, then there could be a problem. And, of course, you know, no one's going to know until that job's taken. But um, there could be an investigation on it. Um, if there's any specific questions, though, uh, it's not that uh, – you know, folks can't go work uh, in the private sector, you know, or continue to work in the private sector after public service. Um, if there's any specific questions, then, you know, the city attorney's office would be more than happy to, you know, look at the details of it as, as the FPPC would. And so other best practices. Um, in general, if there's just one rule of thumb to remember is look at every decision you're making and ask yourself, does it involve some kind of financial interest for you? Uh, if it does, then that's the red flag. That's the gut feeling. You know, if it affects your pocketbook, then there's these different rules I've talked about. There's these different tests. It uh, doesn't always mean that you have to disqualify yourself, but uh, sometimes you do. And if it's a contract, disqualification isn't enough. The contract just can't be entered into. Okay, so uh, we have three more uh, areas to go over. Um, they won't take as long as the first one, but I think now would be a good time for a break. So let's take a five-minute break, and we'll come back uh, at 4.20.
Okay, if I could have all your attention again. We're ready to launch into part two of the 2017 AB 1234 training. So after the first half, who's excited to be here? <laughs> all right. Thank you. Okay, so if you could take your seats. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there were four main areas we were going over. Uh, the first one was personal financial interest. Now we'll talk about perks of office, and then we'll talk about transparency, and then we'll talk about fair process. And so the big one, the one that we just covered, is the one that uh, will come up often and is one that if you think there's something that you need to talk to legal counsel about, please do so. And it's also the one with some of the more significant consequences. And I want to emphasize, too, that usually, if it's not a contract, the remedy is disqualification. And that's common for that to happen. And as one would expect, um, you know, public officials, uh, part of the reason why they're getting involved in public service is they do have roots in the community. So disqualifications inevitably will come up. Um, the question is, is just making sure that you do do the disqualification. So perks, um, this is issues of basically using public resources for uh, your own personal use um, and getting benefits here and there from your job um, and the rules that govern that. So public servants should not receive special benefits by virtue of their position. That's kind of a, just a general rule. And so the Political Reform Act is going to govern um, a lot of these rules here. And that will apply to, of course, elected officials. Um, it'll apply to the designated employees of the city, uh, which will include all appointed officials. And then it also will include candidates for any elected office. Now, there's two kinds of perks. Uh, perks that others offer you and perks you can give yourself because you have access to city resources. So the basic rules, uh, I've mentioned these before, is that if you receive a gift of $50 or more from any one source over the course of a year um, that it needs to be reported, that's capped at $470 from that one source. Um, there are exceptions for some kinds of travel and informational materials. And also, that can turn into a disqualifying interest if you reach that 470 threshold. Now, I want to emphasize that, uh, you know, gifts from family and friends uh, are not subject to this. Uh, on the basis of if there's a mutual exchange of gifts, then generally it's not going to apply. So, you know, if you have uh, some friends that, you know, you might exchange gifts with for the holidays, for a special occasion, or just throughout the year, you know, you might give them, you know, I don't know, a book that you like, uh, you thought they would enjoy reading. Um, they might, you know, pay for uh, movie tickets. Um, and this is something that's mutual, then you're not reporting it. We're talking about when it's a one-way street, where people pretty much have no reason to give you gifts other than you're a public official. And that's what this is applying to. So gifts, gifts, oh, uh, yes? Uh, the question is, is what if you have friends who are contractors? Well, then it gets tricky. Uh, yeah, um, I would uh, suggest if in doubt, report it. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think you want to be in a position where, um, you know, you received uh, suddenly a $5,000 gift from uh, a contractor friend uh, when usually it was like, you know, a $20 gift. And uh, you want to be saying, well, we always exchange gifts. Well, if you're giving $5,000 gifts to the contractor regularly, then, uh, you know, it might work. It might be mutual. But um, often the question is, is whether it's a one-way street or a two-way street. Yes? The question is, is on, 
Yeah, the question is, is campaign uh, regulations. Uh, that's a whole different set of rules. And you are pointing out, uh, uh, you know, a reasonably uh, a reasonable uh, uh, conclusion that there's inconsistency, <laughs> if I could sound so, fancy. So to answer your question, I mean, if I'm a city councilman and I get a gift or a contribution from a city council, I'm going to have to pay the I'm sorry, the the question is is whether it's a campaign contribution? Yeah. The campaign yeah. contribution was twenty thousand dollars. Yeah. Four months later that same developer is in front of city council and that city councilman makes the decision to uh, rezone the land or whatever. There is no conflict of interest. Uh under the law right now, uh it sounds like from what you're describing there is not going to be a conflict. Um, for what it's worth, uh, campaign contributions have their own whole separate set of regulations, and uh, candidates have to, um, I think it's if it's over $1,000 or more that they're going to spend on their campaign, they have to register with the FPPC, create a campaign committee, and then any money that comes into the campaign, they have to report that, and then what they spend it on, they have to report it, and they have to open up a bank account, they have to have a treasurer. Um, now, uh, if all those rules are followed, can a developer then donate 10000 bucks to a candidate? Yes. Um, and really, right now, the way the law is set up, and I won't take a position on campaign finance laws, um, but maybe there's some room for change. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the way the law is set up right now, uh, the issue is that the public has the right to know who's donating money to you and what you're spending it on. Um, and uh, if all the rules are followed, then the situation described where there's campaign donations and then, you know, uh, decisions made involving that campaign donator, then that's not violating any laws. Any other questions on that topic? Okay. Um, so uh, gifts don't always have bows, which means that it's not just money. Uh, it can be meals, food, drink, um, entertainment, certain kinds of travel and lodging. Um, one common question that people will get is that uh, perhaps uh, a discounted ticket is provided to somebody um, and it is through virtue probably of their position. Um, if you get it, say, at half price, um, you take the value of the gift and you report that, meaning that if it was a $100 ticket and you get it for $50 because you're a public official, then you consider yourself to receive a $50 gift. So that's the way you look at that. Um, there's a whole slew of rules on tickets, uh, whether or not you're getting tickets. Um, these rules, a lot of them came into play a number of years ago when the mayor via Ragosa of Los Angeles was discovered to be attending, I think, just about every Lakers game free and getting all the uh, uh, possible uh, drink and food and extra stuff you could imagine. And uh, it used to be that if there was a ceremonial role that somebody played at an event, you could get these tickets and they weren't gifts. Well, Via Ragosa really wasn't doing anything other than just being at the event and waving, I think, every now and then. So the rules were tightened up on gift tickets. Um, basically, um, if it's uh, tickets that are given to the city and then they're distributed to employees, um, and the, usually these are donations, then uh, they probably will be considered gifts unless there is um, a strict uh, policy adopted by the city on gift tickets um, from outside sources. They're still going to be reported, it's just that they're not subject to the gift limit. Um, but uh, this is often applicable to, like I say, like Los Angeles or San Francisco where there's lots of huge events in the city uh, and tickets are being handed out. Um, gifts. Um, gifts include gifts to your family, uh, and they can presumptively include gifts to your spouse or your kids. Um, it's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, obviously, if you don't get the new car, but your husband or wife does, then that could still be a gift if it's coming from a developer. Uh, raffles and gift exchanges. Um, if the city has a raffle uh, and the city pays for the prizes, or if uh, the employees of the city all donate prizes, then that's fine. But if an outside 
uh, businessman or woman donates, say, $20,000 in raffle uh, gifts to the city and you receive the prize, then that can be a gift. Um, so if it's an outside source. Uh, this is a good one. It comes uh, from about 100 years ago. Uh, you can't get free transportation from the railroads. <laughs> so if, if any of the railroads are offering you free tickets, you're going to have to report it. But uh, this, this really doesn't come up anymore, uh, really. It's an old law. Um, something that not everyone's aware of is that you can't get paid for public speeches. Um, you can't accept honoraria. Um, can anyone think of examples of this being in the news recently? Any hands or anyone? Um, well, uh, the comment was Hillary Clinton. Um, Hillary Clinton, along with just about every other national figure, uh, it seems uh, often as soon as they leave office, they start giving speeches, getting lots of money for it. Um, well, you can't do it while you're in office <laughs> is uh, the rule, um, unless you donate the money to a charity um, or uh, you uh, regularly give public speeches. It's just part of your profession. Um, yes? The question is, is what if your spouse is giving speeches? Um, you know, I, I think that it would be considered uh, maybe or maybe not a gift. Um, you would have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I would think that the general rule of if it's your normal job to be doing public speaking and getting paid for it, then it's not considered prohibited. So if your spouse is a public speaker who is always out, I don't know, doing motivational speeches or something and getting paid, they don't have to stop doing that. But if suddenly a month after you know you become a public official your spouse is offered ten thousand bucks to go talk to you know uh, uh, some local business group that could be a problem so an example of uh, gifts uh, and tickets perks um, California regulators in 2014 cracked down on a company named Stone and Youngberg um, this was a, a company that was uh, giving a bunch of gifts to uh, local officials. Um, it was meals, baseball tickets, cookies, other gifts. They were a bond finance company. And uh, looks like they did pretty good work. I mean, here's an example of uh, uh, one of the bonds that they uh, provide. They helped work on, uh, um, helped develop this structure here. But it turned out that uh, the folks that were getting the bonds were also getting gifts from this company. Um, and, of course, uh, there probably were other bond companies that weren't getting the business. And so the FPPC ended up uh, fining a lot of people, and um, there were uh, fees that had to be paid. Another example, um, San Diego County and De La Rosa and Company scandal. Um, this was also gifts that were being given to public officials. Uh, these gifts were from investment bankers. And um, what had happened was that after the gifts were received, they weren't reported properly, and there were $24,000 in fines, and um, you ended up having uh, penalties being assessed for uh, items as small as um, a ticket to a Padres game worth, 20, worth $40 and then a $20 meal at Cardiff by the Sea two months later. The example I bring, the reason why I bring this up is that each of those, the $40 and $20 by themselves, don't need to be reported. But since it added up to over 50 bucks over two months, it became a gift from one source that had to be reported. And the issue here is not the acceptance of $60 total in a meal and a Padres ticket. It's that it wasn't reported. And again, the whole point is so the public knows who's giving you gifts. So this sad guy here is in jail. Uh, he didn't report his gifts. Uh, I'm sure he did other stuff too. He wouldn't be in jail for just not reporting the gifts. But um, there can be up to $5,000 per violation. Um, you can own uh, your own attorney's fees. And also private uh, action by citizens who prosecute these cases, they can get attorney's fees from you too. So you can pay for their fees and your own. So use of public resources. We just talked about the first half of perks, which is uh, people giving you gifts because you're a public official. Um, there's also the use of the public resources that the agency controls. 
Um, essentially, staff time, equipment, tools, vehicles, computers, supplies, you know, obviously that's the cities and you shouldn't be using it for personal purposes. Um, there are narrow exceptions for incidental and minimal use. Um, that is, for example, uh, you know, you might make a phone call, you know, from the work phone. Um, I mean, that's not going to break the law if it's for personal reasons, but, um, you know, you shouldn't be, you know, doing it all day long. Then it goes beyond incidental and minimal. Uh, yes, in the back. Uh, the question is, is what about if you're involved with a nonprofit and you're using uh, city equipment? Uh, it would depend on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, if the city has decided to let the nonprofit use the material, then that certainly can be fine. Um, the issue would be if, uh, you know, um, you're taking a city car for a three-month, uh, uh, you know, uh, tour vacation of, uh, you know, the Northwest or something, <laughs> and, uh, you know, you're using city credit card for gas, et cetera. Um, expense reimbursement. Um, so uh, the city uh, um, will have a policy and limits on what kind of expenses can be reimbursed, um, different rates for food, lodging, transportation. And uh, the issue here is just uh, documentation and making sure you follow the policy if it applies to you. And the basic rule is that if you're going to be reimbursed, it should be actual and necessary to what you're doing. And, uh, you know, each city has its own different policies on that. But um, you can't uh, be obviously expensing uh, something that has nothing to do with um, city business. Again, consequences of violations. Um, civil penalties can be up to $1,000 a day, uh, three times the value of the resource you used. Uh, criminal penalties can apply, and also income tax implications, kind of the Al Capone, uh, I guess, uh, uh, example at the end. Um, after all this other law that comes into play, then, of course, the IRS will want their cut, too, and that can be a consequence. Okay, here we go. This is why we're all here today. This guy right here throwing the money in the air. Um, there was a guy named Willard Murray Jr. Uh, he was an L.A. County legislator. Uh, he was one of the guys that um, helped bring about uh, the spotlight on uh, abuses that the AB 1234 class is meant and different laws are meant to control. Um, there had been a history in California of some agencies, and it actually wasn't as much the cities. It was more water boards and um, special districts and whatnot. Um, but they were blatantly abusing uh, the public dime. Uh, staff and directors were misusing public resources. The Sacramento Bee um, did an investigation on this, focusing on the Sacramento Suburban Water District. And it turned out that... Um, the uh, uh, folks on this board were doing things like uh, being paid up to $900,000 over the course of two years for just sitting on the board. I mean, this makes uh, a bell seem like child's play in some respects to what they were doing here. Um, and this guy, Willard Murray Jr., I have in my notes, um, he was simultaneously why there were these issues with Sacramento. Uh, in L.A. County, um, he would go and... Uh, have dinner at a strip club. He would charge 50 bucks to the city for the dinner, but not order dinner. Uh, he'd charge the, the city 150 bucks for a meeting with a friend on official business, um, times two because he would claim there were two meetings going on. And at the end of the night, he would end up making about $400. And this was just regular practice for this guy. Um, and uh, other folks were basically using agency credit cards for personal purposes, misreporting income double dipping on expense reimbursements like I was talking about. And so in 2003, the Sacramento Bee did a big expose on this, focusing on water districts up near Sacramento, but also throughout the state, different agencies. And uh, after this investigation, Assembly Bill 1234 was passed, which uh, required both ethics training and then also at the same time, they beefed up some of the Political Reform Act laws that I've been talking about today. Another example um, of somebody who's just grossly violated these rules, uh, Colton council member and church minister, um, he racked up over $5,000 in illicit charges on his city credit card. Uh, these included phone sex charges and stays at local hotels. 
And his excuse was his nephew had stolen his phone three times, and his nephew had done it. Um, and what's ironic is this guy had got elected on the issue of cleaning up local government. And um, I have uh, my uh, little note here. He ran on the platform of restoring public trust in government. The likelihood of success, zero. So another issue on use of public resources is political use of public resources. Um, this isn't going to involve a lot of the folks in the room uh, because you wouldn't, won't be involved necessarily in ballot campaigns in the first place or be involved in leading up to, say, ballot measures or um, uh, election, uh, election issues. But basically, uh, the city can't spend public resources on advocating one way or the other on a ballot measure. The city can educate the public about a ballot measure and give the facts. But the city can't spend money saying vote yes or no for either certain politicians or for certain ballot measures. And so that's the individuals or agencies, um, the first bullet point there. Uh, mass mailing restrictions. Um, to keep it simple, uh, if you have 200 or more pieces of uh, identical, identical or similar pieces of mailings, then uh, there's restrictions that apply when they go out to the public. Um, and so essentially you can't be sending out mass mailings to the uh, local residents if it's going to promote uh, officials in the city rather than promoting a city cause. So just remember 200 pieces or more. Yes? If the city Um, the question is, is that if the city council uh, puts a measure on the ballot, can they promote passage of it? Um, that's a good question. Um, there are basically limits on what the city council can or can't do. Um, the city council, if they put a ballot measure before the voters for, say, um, a UUT or uh, a road repair tax, um, the city council can pass a resolution saying they support the passage of it. The city council can spend money on educating the voters with the facts on it, but the city council can't send out flyers saying vote yes on this measure or vote no on this measure. Um, you know, workshops can be held. Um, the issue is um, whether or not city money is being used to advocate or to educate. And, uh, you know, it's, it's routine throughout cities all throughout California, especially when there's local ballot measures that the city has put before the voters for there to be uh, a large education campaign. So voters know what the facts are and why the ballot measure is there. Um, but the city can't send out flyers that private groups can saying vote yes on Measure X or vote no on Measure X. Yes? Um, actually, uh, for emails, uh, the question is, is the mass mailings apply to emails? Uh, the answer is in this situation, no, they don't. Um, the, uh, rules have not caught up in this area with electronic transmissions. It has to be uh, a material piece of paper and the actual restriction is that you can't have, uh, pictures or have just the name of one council member elected official. You can have all five council members on there, their names printed if it's 200 or more pieces. The, the idea is to make sure that um, city officials don't send out a thousand pieces of mail every week with, uh, you know, their picture on it to everybody in the city. So, um, you know, especially around election time. But emails, they can uh, send out as many as they want. And then gifts of public funds. Um, so uh, the city obviously can't give gifts of public funds, meaning that if the city wants to uh, buy something from someone and do a contract, that's fine. But the city can't just obviously cut a $5,000 check to somebody because they think they're a good citizen, you know, for no good reason. Um, and that's in the state constitution. So best practices. Uh, avoid perks and the temptation to rationalize about them. Uh, it's legally risky and there can be a public relations headache. And when to ask for help. Um, don't end up like this guy here on the cartoon. Uh, he chose to go it alone and now he needs help and it's too late. He's just sitting there. 
Uh, if you have doubts, uh, you know, ask the uh, city attorney's office, ask the city manager, call the FPPC. Uh, don't wait until the meeting because um, I can speak for myself and I think most city attorneys that if you ask the city attorney five minutes before the meeting, here are the facts, should I disqualify myself? You're almost always going to get the answer, well, the meeting's in two minutes, yeah, you're going to have to disqualify yourself, better safe than sorry. If you contact the attorney a week before and they can review the issues, do some research, then you'll get a more solid answer. So don't wait for the meeting uh, when you're seeking the legal counsel. Uh, now group three. Uh, we've gone over, first of all, personal financial conflicts. We've gone over perks. And now there's transparency laws. Um, so transparency laws are basically the sunshine laws, the idea that the public can see what the city government's doing. And like this guy down here with his big uh, magnifying glass. So there's a couple of core transparency rules in California law. Uh, one is the Public Records Act. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. Basically, the presumption is, is that any document the city has in its possession is assumed to be a public record subject to inspection and review unless an exception applies. And so it's important to know that the assumption is that every single document at City Hall, the public has the right to review. You start with that assumption and then see if an exception applies. Now, there are a number of exceptions. If there's litigation going on, personal privacy, um, there's, in fact, uh, uh, you know, scores of them that you can go through. But you assume the public can review it unless an exception applies. Uh, the other big transparency rule, Brown Act. Uh, that's basically our open meeting law, which is that the public has the right to be at council meetings, to know when they're going to occur, and the right to speak at them. Um, public records, like I said, basically you assume everything in City Hall is a public record, unless there's an exception. That includes agendas, meeting materials, um, other writings prepared, owned, used, or retained by the agency. Um, the consequences of not providing a public record when the city should, uh, obviously adverse media attention, and then uh, the city can pay for the attorney's fees of the other side uh, if they have to go to court to get the documents. Yes? Um, the question is, is whether or not uh, if somebody makes a Public Records Act request for a correction notice on a project, uh, generally the assumption would be that, yes, they would be able to get that correction notice unless there's some privacy interest or some sort of um, uh, uh, interest involving uh, bidding that hasn't been completed yet. Um, but if the uh, or there's a, a proprietary or trade secret for the contractor. But in general, um, I would think that a correction notice would be a public record. Uh, but I would need to look at the exact specific situation before we'd know whether it would be released or not. Does that answer the question? Yes? Uh, the question is, is uh, the time limit on posting agendas uh, under Brown Act is if it's statewide or city by city. State law requires that uh, for regular meetings, you post them 72 hours in advance. And um, some cities will do it more than 72, but usually um, it's, it's followed 72 hours at least. Uh, special meetings, it's 24 hours in advance. Um, and so... Um, that's basically when it's going to be available to the public, the agendas. Chris. Yeah. On uh, releasing materials, uh, sometimes us engineers have to practice law, too. Um, <laughs> and we, we call things work product. That's yeah. This banter about in the 20s. So you, you're not, you can't release work product. I'm still not sure what work product is and what... Uh, the question is, is uh, uh, 
when is uh, something that's called work product uh, not a public record subject to disclosure? Uh, well, if it's an attorney work product, then it's confidential. Um, if an engineer is working on it, uh, it would need to be a trade secret or proprietary for it to not be released. Any other questions right now? Yes? Uh, the question is, is whether the requester has to pay for copying costs. Uh, the city can require the requester to pay for the direct copying costs, and that's it. Um, so it's just literally like how much per page it costs to crank out the copy machine, and you can't re you can't have them uh, pay for staff time. You know, it could take four hours to dig around in city files. It could take five minutes. You can't charge them for the staff time. Um, and this uh, increasingly, as cities become more and more electronic uh, with their uh, files, it's becoming a lot harder for cities to respond in a cost-effective way to records requests because. 40 years ago, there just weren't as many files at City Hall. I mean, you know, now that we have internet and emails, but that's a different issue. Um, the Public Records Act is modeled on FOIA, which is the, the, the question was, is this different than FOIA? The Freedom of Information Act, the Federal Public Records Act, um, the California Public Records Act is based on it, but it's different. Um, however, uh, if there's a rule that the Federal Freedom of Information Act has, the California Public Records Act says that unless there's a direct contradiction in California law, you follow federal as well. Oh, well, that uh, the question is, is in FOIA, um, the requesters have to pay for staff time. Uh, for California, it's uh, just state law that you could only require them to pay for copying time. So that is a difference between FOIA and the California PRA. Yes? Yeah, the question is, is uh, what to do with drafts in regards to the Public Records Act? Um, drafts, notes, and notes and preliminary memorandum are expressly exempt from disclosure anyways. Um, so, uh, I mean, you know, that can't be abused, but, um, you know, if you have nine versions uh, and then you have a final product, uh, you know, drafts are not immediately disclosable in the Public Records Act. Yeah, no, notes, uh, depending on the situation, but if you just have like some handwritten notes, uh, I mean, the typical example is like a yellow post-it with just some scribbles on it. Um, that's not something that's subject to the Public Records Act. The idea is that um, you don't want to stop the city from doing its internal business before it reaches a final product. In fact, there's an exemption called the deliberative process exemption, which is that you don't want to have the decision makers, as they're making their decision, uh, shut down and not discuss things openly. So that's another exemption too. Um, the question is, is that our drafts like the work product that Rob is talking about? It could be. It, it would depend on the specific uh, documents. And uh, I, I can't say um, which ones would be exempt or wouldn't just based on, um, you know, the general concepts. The documents need to be reviewed to see if exemptions apply. Okay, so um, financial interest disclosure. Uh, another part of um, transparency is that uh, the public knows through the filing of Form 700s um, what the financial interests uh, public officials have in their community. Uh, this is kind of a bulwark to make sure that uh, if somebody has, uh, you know, overlooked, forgotten, or doesn't think they need to disqualify themselves, the public then can look at the Form 700s and say, well, wait a minute, maybe you should be disqualifying yourself. You know, this is what you put down as your financial interests. So um, you file a Form 700, which is basically just a list of financial interests in the city. Uh, when you assume office, annually while in office, and when you leave office, and then uh, the Secretary of State has similar campaign finance requirements, which kind of um, uh, alludes to the previous issue brought up about campaign uh, restrictions. 
So charitable fundraising, um, in general, if you're raising money for the city, um, if it's over $5,000 that you've raised, then you might need to report that. Um, so just keep that in mind. So best practices in regards to transparency. Uh, assume all the information is public or will become public that you're dealing with. And uh, don't discuss agency business with fellow decision makers outside of meetings. Um, the whole point of the Brown Act is to make sure that when you're making a decision, the public can see how you reach that decision. And that's why, as annoying as it might seem, especially when there's a public hearing, when the decision is, uh, when, the dis when discussion's occurring, it needs to occur on the record and the council members or the commissioners all talk amongst themselves with everyone listening. Um, because the alternative is that everyone shows up with their mind made up and then the public doesn't know how they reach the decision and the public isn't privy to why they reach that decision. Um, so Brown Act, just to emphasize the open meeting laws, the government code uh, provides all meetings of the legislative body shall be open and public. All persons shall be permitted to attend any meeting of the legislative body. Um, this applies to all commissions, boards, and committees appointed by the city council. Um, specifically, uh, conducting business at open meetings. Um, a majority may not consult outside a properly noticed meeting. Um, Serial communications, the second bullet point. Um, I want to emphasize that uh, you can engage in a Brown Act violation, if you will, in a slow motion manner, which means that you might send an email to somebody saying, hey, what do you think about this issue? And if it's just one other person, then you haven't violated the Brown Act because it's not a quorum yet. But then two weeks later, that email is forwarded to a third person and says, hey, this is what you know, uh, Commissioner uh, 1 thought, what do you think, Commissioner 3? Suddenly a Brown Act violation can occur. It's a slow motion serial meeting, and that's something to keep in mind. <coughs> so a meeting is any time there's a gathering of a majority of the members of the legislative body or commission uh, to hear, discuss, or deliberate. Um, communication can be through personal intermediaries, it can be through email, it can be through blogs. Um, it's not just the way it used to be where either you're in the same room or you weren't. And then uh, what is a meeting? It takes place if there's a quorum uh, and they receive information, discuss or deliberate. Um, interesting example is uh, this meeting today was noticed. Because even though, obviously, you know, none of the commissions or boards, committees, or the council are going to be making decisions on city business, you know, better safe than sorry, um, you know, notice this because you have a majority of some of the bodies here in this room, and it's possible that there could be a discussion through this meeting on city business. So this meeting was noticed. Yes? Yep. Are there any members of the public here? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I didn't do that one. They would have sat through this one, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, this is a public meeting right now. And um, however, what is not a meeting? Uh, just because three commissioners on a five commission board happen to be in line together at the supermarket doesn't suddenly mean there's an automatic Brown Act violation. Um, there can be individual contact, public conferences, um, other local agency meetings, community meetings, and social gatherings. Uh, the key is that even if you have a majority or a quorum of your board, commission, committee, or council, even if you're all, say, at the same social gathering, um, as long as you don't discuss city business, you know, you're, you're not violating the Brown Act. But members of the public who see you there might start saying, hey, you know, what were they really doing there? You know, what were they really talking about? So this is one of those public perception issues where you can be in compliance with the Brown Act but still have people upset. So just something to keep in mind with uh, whenever a majority of your commission or uh, council board or committee are in the same room or at the same event. Yes? Mm 
The, the question is, is uh, if there's a tour of a facility uh, by a commission, then how to go about doing that. Best practices would be to notice it um, or not take a majority. Yes. Yes. If, if the if a commission or a committee the question is, is they all go to a city council meeting and they're all there um, that's why well there isn't an automatic violation now if the members are all sitting together in the audience and they're all talking about business of the city then there could be a violation um, if they're sitting in different areas of the room or they could all be sitting together um, and as long as there's no discussion of city business amongst themselves but again, uh, it's the public perception, especially on this issue, that really gets folks in hot water because uh, somebody across the room sees a majority of a commission sitting together at a council meeting. Um, they might not hear anything that you all are discussing amongst themselves, but they turn it into, oh, well, how do we know what they were talking about? You know, maybe it was really kind of a secret meeting out in public, you know. Um, so... Certainly all five can be in the same room at the same time and there's no Brown Act violation. Uh, there is one if a majority discusses city business, but ask yourself what's public perception and do you want the headache of somebody coming to one of your meetings and saying, I saw you guys, I saw all of you in you know, that coffee house together. And, you know, that's, again, why public perception matters here. Uh, so agenda requirements. Um, an agenda is required for uh, every regular meeting or adjourned regular meeting. Uh, there shouldn't be action or discussion on any item not on the agenda. Um, the whole reason for this is that uh, if the public has the right to hear and witness how a decision is being made, they need to know when the decision is being made. So obviously it needs to be on the agenda. Yes? The, the question is is whether or not uh, there can be a clarifying question. Uh, it, the, well, I believe the question is that if one member of a commission has a question for staff after an agenda comes out, should the answer from staff be sent to all commissioners or just one commissioner? Um, it can vary from situation to situation, but uh, generally if all the commissioners get the answer, um, that often is... Uh, uh, you know, a, a better way of dealing with it with the condition that nobody replies all to that email. So it needs to be a one-way street. Um, and the problem is, is that uh, you'll get an email with information and it's sent to all the commissioners or all the council members. And that's fine. Uh, but then somebody does a reply all and says, well, you know, this sounds great, but I wanted to add, you know, uh, let's have balloons, you know. And then someone else jumps in and says, yeah, well, balloons and clowns, you know. Suddenly, boom, you got a Brown Act violation. Exactly. And so depending on the situation, sometimes uh, it's not advisable to send it out to everybody. Um, I mean, it just depends on, on how the council that's handling that one deals with it. Yeah, Dana? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, the um, city clerk just uh, mentioned that if there is uh, a significant question or answer that comes after the agenda is reported, then there'll be an addendum to the public report. And that's good so the public then knows the information they received. Yes? Uh, the question is, is um, if Commissioner uh, A and C both ask uh, the same question of Commissioner B, who happens to be the chair, is that a violation of the Brown Act? Uh, not necessarily. 
Um, because uh, the question, if it's truly a question, is not indicating how the questioner is going to vote on an issue. They're just seeking information. And so if the chair is going to be providing an answer to a question, um, that doesn't mean there's been deliberation. But it's getting into dangerous territory um, when you have situations like that. Um, so when you have your agenda at your meetings, um, stay on point uh, because uh, you need to make sure that uh, all the matters obviously uh, should be transacted or discussed or else it's going to be continued. Um, you need a reasonable period of time for the public to comment either before or during consideration of the item. It can vary from commission and, uh, and council uh, to city on whether there's a public comment period at the beginning um, or whether there's public comment before each item. So agenda requirements, exceptions. Uh, the general rule is there's no discussion of any item not on the agenda. Um, however, there are exceptions, and I added this little joke here. I thought it was kind of funny. It's the thing about, you know, uh, A-E-I-O-U and sometimes why. Well, here, Y is being accused of consorting with known vowels. So what's going on, Y? You know, are you, are you not a vowel? So, <laughs> so um, there are exceptions to uh, agenda requirements. Uh, brief responses, statements or questions, um, questions for clarification. Um, this comes up sometimes if uh, a member of the public asks uh, some question um, and, you know, of course, um, you know, they want a response and there can be brief responses. It's just it shouldn't turn into a discussion item where you have an hour long discussion and try to make some decisions. Public participation in meeting. Um, of course, as we all know, the public has the right to show up and comment at uh, the different meetings. Um, Something to note is that uh, although it's common to ask for the names of uh, somebody before they publicly comment, uh, they can refuse to do that and still have the right to engage in anonymous speech. Um, the public can record the proceedings by video, film, or audio tape. And generally, unless they're actually disrupting the meeting, they have the right to be there. So unless they're like preventing the meeting from literally moving forward, then um, they generally can be there. And uh, there are a number of famous cases out there where city councils have reasonably had somebody leave because they were being somewhat disruptive. And the courts have said, well, not really. I mean, they weren't being too disruptive. So, um, you know, the city does not want a First Amendment lawsuit. Um, civil rights liability, it can get very expensive. Yes. The question is, is what if somebody doesn't adhere to the three minute rule? Well, I'm sure that never happens. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, um, if somebody, uh, yes, the cities can limit public comment reasonably. Uh, generally, it's from three to five minutes. If somebody goes over the three minutes, common practice is to maybe let them speak for a few more seconds. Uh, if it's getting abused, then uh, it's best to just turn the mic off. I mean, I don't know if there's a mic turn off button that's used, but, um, you know, some cities actually have a timer on it. So the mic just some automatically goes off and you can't hear them anymore. Um, oh, OK, yeah. Uh, Jesse's more than happy to turn the mic off, he said in the back. <laughs> Uh, closed session. Um, closed sessions are when the public can't be there when a decision's being made. Uh, it's very limited. Real property negotiations, litigation, labor, personnel matters. Uh, they are confidential. Um, you can't be discussing basically money issues in closed sessions except in rare cases. Failure to comply with the Brown Act. Uh, the decision can be nullified. Uh, in extreme cases, it's criminal misdemeanor. Um, if somebody wants to complain that the Brown Act was not followed or make a claim, uh, they must demand corrective active from the action from the city. They have to give the city a chance to basically cure the problem by essentially re-noticing it and doing the decision again, if that's possible. So we've gone over uh, first personal financial interests. Uh, we've talked about perks. We've talked about transparency. 
And then this is the last subject, and this one goes quick, and then we'll be done, which is fair process laws. So as a decision maker, the public expects you to be impartial and avoid favoritism. So what is fair process? Uh, basically, it's providing due process uh, when it's required and making sure that you aren't biased. So for the basic decision that's being made, uh, you need to ask yourself, is it a legislative decision or is it a quasi-judicial decision? And the difference is, is that a legislative decision is when you're making the rules. A quasi-judicial decision is applying the rules. And there's more due process rights involved when you're applying rules because people have the right to have you know, evidence, they have the right for a public hearing, they have the right for testimony. However, if you're making the rules, which is say uh, you know, you're passing an ordinance or uh, you're approving a contract um, or there's some zoning change, if you're making a rule, making a decision for a rule, um, there isn't as much due process. Um, the reason why I bring this up is that when there is uh, the requirement for a public hearing, it's often because you're applying rules. And so people have a constitutional right to get testimony in and to make sure that there's a public hearing. Um, in regards to due process, what kind of impermissible bias is there? Um, a personal interest in the decision's outcome, a financial interest, uh, personal bias or factual bias. Um, what I want to emphasize here is that uh, there are a number of court cases, I've listed three of them here, where uh, council members or planning commissioners had had decisions basically uh, overturned that they'd made because somebody went to court and said that I know they were so biased before they made their decision that they couldn't give me a fair hearing. How did the court determine that they were biased? Because the council member, commissioner, board member, board member, committee member had been either publishing articles or talking before the meeting saying, I've already made up my mind. I don't care what the evidence says. I don't care what staff presents to me. I know what I'm going to do, and this is how it's going to be. Um, if you feel that strongly about it, then you should probably just disqualify yourself before uh, the meeting, abstain from it. Um, but just a word of advice, don't be going around saying that my mind's so closed that I'm not going to listen to the evidence at the meeting. And if you do do that, then you might get a court to overturn the decision. Um, there's also incompatible office prohibitions. Um, the classic example is that the mayor and uh, cannot be uh, the a planning commissioner. Um, you have to have uh, different people on planning commission uh, as you have on city council. And also another fair process law, competitive bidding requirements. So those of you that do uh, public works projects uh, are probably the most familiar with this. Um, state law requires that we have competitive bidding for public works projects. The basic idea is that the city, first of all, should try to spend uh, its money the most efficient way possible, so there's competitive bidding. Second of all, the state laws want to make sure that uh, the decision makers aren't handing out contracts to their friends. The friend has to be the most qualified to get the job. And disqualification can apply too if you have family members that are before uh, you and you're making a decision involving them. Um, campaign contribution restrictions. We already kind of talked about this where if you are an elected official and you receive campaign contributions, there isn't an automatic issue if the contributor comes before the elected body. However, if you're on an appointed board and you're running for an elected office, then you need to be careful about making decisions for your campaign contributors. Um, so to keep it simple, if you decide to run for elected office and you start collecting money from people that are before your appointed board's decision-making area, um, then you need to disqualify yourself generally from deciding on those issues. Um, to give an example, if you're on planning commission and uh, a month before you're uh, hearing an application on rezoning, you take a $5,000 contribution from that person who's seeking the rezoning, then you should disqualify yourself from uh, that decision. Um, that same rule doesn't apply to elected officials, though. And you can't solicit campaign contributions from city employees. 
Um, if city employees uh, are um, uh, subject to uh, just a general solicitation that goes out to the general public, that's one thing, and that's fine. But you shouldn't generally be soliciting campaign contributions directly from city employees. So best practices, um, think fairness and merit-based decision-making in your decisions. Uh, keep politics separate from relationships with agency staff. And avoid uh, committing and commenting before the public hearing. And that last one, like I said, is it's a pretty simple one. Uh, but just remember that if you're advertising to the public before you make a decision that no matter what happens there, you've made up your mind, now you probably are a little biased about it. And if you're telling that to people, then they could go to court and overturn the decision. So be careful on that one. Um, there are resources for further reading. Um, if you haven't gotten enough today, uh, there's a handout that's been provided. Um, there's also books out there provided by the Institute from Local Government. And so um, we're just about done. And the questions I think you should ask yourself uh, if you're wondering what is the public ethic uh, involved here, what is the public law ethical principle, uh, what would inspire the public to have trust in the decision you're making? Uh, would you feel comfortable with whatever you've done being reported on the front page of the local newspaper? That's a good question to ask yourself. And also, when it's all said and done, how do you want to be remembered? So the key lessons, the law sets minimum standards for ethical behavior. I've gone over ethical laws today. Uh, by no means uh, would I presume that I'm going to be teaching people personal ethics. Uh, I've gone over just the rules that Sacramento enforces today, but there are higher ethical standards for sure than what I've gone over today. Uh, it's your choice how high you want to set your own personal ethical standards. And uh, that concludes the AB 1234 training. Make sure you sign in and turn in your proof of participation certificate. And Dana has an announcement. All right, thank you all.